Welcome to Fall 2019 DLS Series. We've got a great series of seminars and lectures coming up. We have a tremendous diversity coming through. Um, all the dates are filled except September 19th, which is a maybe. We're not quite sure if that speaker's going to be able to make it. But uh, we got great feedback from faculty members across the diversity department. So it should be a fun seminar series. Um, we're starting out with two weeks of faculty introductions. Um, just as a way to kind of reintroduce ourselves to each other, the folks of us have been here for a long period of time, as well as introduce folks to uh, new students, new folks, maybe they're not aware of what everyone does. It's just a good practice to then get a handle on, hey, oh, that's right, someone's got expertise in this. What is it that we're doing? Uh, the idea is it's good for us, it's good for the students. And then we finish, we actually, our college is hosting one of the, um, uh, uh, Frontiers of Science lectures on carbon sequestration uh, at the end of the semester and the speaker there that will be on Wednesday um, and then the speaker will be coming and giving a departmental seminar on Thursday. So we're starting with faculty writ large then across the diversity of, of topics and then finishing with both the Frontiers and a DLS back to that. For today I Lowell and I decided that it would be <laughs> a great idea to have this faculty introduction in Pecha Kucha, something like that, or Ignite Talks. Uh, graduate students have heard three minute thesis. It's a way to quickly, efficiently, precisely communicate what's important. You might have heard it as an elevator pitch. You know, so what is it that you want to be able to tell about your work? Why does it matter? Why are we here? Why are we at the university? What's exciting? What is that we contribute? You know, what skills do I have? What courses do I teach? And so the charge was, this is the order that we're going to go through. We're going to start with our uh, fall semester department chair um, and then work our way through. So if your name is on here, memorize who comes before you because we're going to go through quickly. The slides are all time. There's a quick transition in between each. And so at the end of three minutes, boom. It's gone, and the next speaker should be coming up. So the idea is, you guys are laughing, the idea is to have fun with it. Hopefully we all have fun with it. Um, Lowell and I are both going, and I don't know if either one of us have any idea what we're going to say, because we've been putting it together. But the idea is to have fun with it, and to learn a little bit about it. You can talk about anything that you want. All the slides or images that you said. If you said one, you have three minutes on that one slide. If you said nine, you have 20 seconds for each slide. Somebody might have sent mine. Um, and any in between. So they're just going to advance and then at the end. Uh, if you want to dialogue with the audience or ask questions, that's fine. Um, oh, your three minutes is up. <laughs> okay, Lowell's next. <laughs> Finish the introduction. Okay. So. Paul, you ready? Yeah, don't start until I'm standing. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. one. Go. Okay, so I'm going to go from the specific to the more general and philosophical, but the specific uh, deals with uh, Lake Bonneville and the work that I've done over many years on this. This is a particularly uh, useful uh, slide. It's from the north end of the Promontory Mountains. We know a lot about Bonneville from the shoreline, Bonneville shoreline, the Provo, which is Provo's here, Bonneville there. This shows a lot of these intermediate shorelines that had been sort of a mystery to us all uh, for a long period of time. We're not sure whether they uh, represent climate cycles or possibly uh, something else. Almost has to be climate, but. Uh, how long that had existed and what caused it uh, is sort of an unknown. So that's the specific. The next slide will be transitioning uh, to the maybe more general. And it's you're going to see a picture of my favorite guy in the world of science. And my second favorite guy is this guy named Arvid Johnson, who published this book that was inspirational to me as an undergraduate going in the direction I did. 
Gilbert performed the normal operations of gathering and classifying field data, mapping and describing, but he had an additional goal. He tried to understand what he saw in each outcrop. He refused to interpret natural, natural phenomena without following sets of mechanically, mechanically sound rules or without imagining an analog between the geologic process and a process with which he was familiar. So this is what got me interested in sort of the physics of describing uh, different uh, natural phenomena, and particularly what's in uh, Lake Bonneville and how we use computer models and phys uh, sound physical re uh, reasoning to understand the circulation patterns and so forth. Well, um, as a scientist, I love field work. I love going out in the field. I love computers, and I love math, and I love simulations. I don't like lab work. That's just a reality. Sorry, I appreciate lab work, but I don't like to do it myself. So my latest thing that I like is what's called LIDAR. It can be either ground-based or airborne, and I love it because it's a machine that gives you a million data points in one hour. And that's my kind of machine that you don't get in the lab. And the sort of thing that I'm working on uh, trying to use uh, this basic philosophical approach I have uh, to understanding uh, earth science. Well, since it hasn't started, I'm going to cheat. You can press. Okay, I'm going to explain this in a moment. Just starting by saying, uh, despite my best efforts to the contrary, I've become an old fart. This is my 40th year as a faculty member. Um, the direction that I started in is very different from the direction I'm going now. And the transition really happened in the 1980s when I started working in the Sierra Nevada, left-hand part of the slide, with Alan Glazner, many of you uh, heard give a couple of talks here last year, Andrew Coleman, on the, uh, one of the longest standing problems in geology, and it goes back to the 18th century, and James Hutton, how granite body get into the crust. Uh, and so against my better judgment, I took on that uh, issue. Pretty quickly, we came to the conclusion that the reason why this problem would be so difficult to solve is a bad assumption. And the assumption is that a mapped pluton, say the Cathedral Creek around a diorite right here in Yosemite, represents a body of magma, uh, as opposed to representing what a sedimentary formation is, that is an accumulation over millions of years of rock that all looks similar. Okay. And so uh, a number of lines of evidence that we developed uh, late 1990s, early 2000s led us to conclude that uh, the norm was in fact this latter idea. Uh, it was a very unpopular suggestion to a lot of colleagues because it invalidated many man years of research, um, which were fundamentally based on the idea that this is a magma body. Uh, so early on in that, I got interested then in how what we were learning in the Sierra Nevada, which we continue to pursue, would apply in our backyard here to the Wasatch Igneous Belt. Uh, campus is up here, Salt Lake Valley, Wasatch Mountains. The pink here is the Wasatch Igneous Belt. And uh, after a gestation period of about 15 years, uh, this year John Bowman, my former student, Mike Stearns, and I uh, were awarded NSF funding to pursue this. So uh, what I want to talk for a moment about is how these two things relate to each other. So uh, this business of long-lived incremental growth of plutons really for us originated in studies in the Sierra Nevada. The problem is that this is a planned view. That is, this is a, its original orientation. It's been eroded down to that level. We have very little direct information about what was on top of that. Okay. There are many opinions, but very little evidence. Uh, the nice thing about the Wasatch Igneous Belt is it's been tilted on its side, and we see from the mid-crust up to the Earth's surface and the volcanic equivalents exposed in profile on the map. So these two views are really complementary plan view, profile view. 
the cottonwood stock, this one lithologically very closely resembles the uh, and so we think we've got a good combination of the two to understand these systems in the world. All right. Um, I, my first little bit is really for new students uh, and faculty, other than the faculty, but new students in the group. Um, Professor Pete Lippert, I consider myself a broadly curious or scientist and educator. So students in the room, I'm teaching everything from living with earthquakes and structural geology and tectonics to classes like the magnetic earth. This semester, uh, co-teaching with a whole bunch of people, things like uh, uh, dynamic earth, wasatch in the field, and, and I co-teach uh, set basins, tectonics and set basins with Gary Johnson. So we'll just see a lot of you in these courses in the future. Our team here consists of many familiar faces. Like, um, <laughs> there, uh, what our group does, we work in a variety of processes that, uh, that span a big variety, but the thing that holds it all together are magnets. So we study tectonics. The, we, we move mountains, we close ocean basins. Carrie and I just got funding to go to Mongolia to study these processes. Um, in Mongolia, in the Mesozoic. We uh, also study igneous and geodynamo processes, what is the tempo of magmatic eruptions, particularly here in the western US but also because those lavas give us snapshots of magnetic field behavior, we can study geodynamo processes. Um, so I sped up enough. <laughs> <laughs> I not quite there yet. Okay. We also do a lot of work on fluid rock interactions. In particular, how do fluids interact with rocks and change their magnetization um, from primary magnetization to secondary, or even multiple episodes of remagnetization? How does this affect the way that we can use that information to decode the history of these rocks. Um, so another, probably when I was hired, no one thought I'd be moving into this direction, uh, but we're also working on air quality. In particular, what is the composition and the particle size distribution of iron-based particles that we're breathing during our winter inversion events? So this is a recently funded project through GCSC and Nexus, maybe, uh, working with folks in atmospheric science and, and chemical engineering see if we can, can do this. We also take the, the tempo, or measure the, the tempo of uh, climate and oceanographic change using uh, deep sea drilling cores, like this uh, record in the middle Miocene, or middle Eocene from the North Atlantic. Um, so we tell time in our, in our lab in a lot of different ways, and then tie this to biology. Uh, so we also are doing a lot of work on geo-exobiology, in particular microbes that make magnets. If you didn't know that, now you know. And that's pretty cool. Um, so got a lot of neat projects investigating these, both on this planet and potentially on other planets. And if you want to know more about where those last two themes merge, stick around, because I've been suckered into giving a DLS <laughs> on October 24th. And I'll tell you about the demise of, a, of um, magneto fossils. You'll learn what those are uh, during one of the largest climate transitions in the sun. So, so, thanks. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm a research faculty here, and um, so my main job is, uh, first slide will pop up here, but I'm the co-PI on the Antarctic Search for Meteorites uh, program. And with, along with my uh, other co-PI, we're basically in charge of collecting or searching for and recovering meteorites from Antarctica. There's an image of Antarctica there, um, a mosaic of a radar sat, radar sat uh, imagery, and you can see that it's covered with ice. Antarctica is covered with ice. There's, there's land on there, but there's a lot of ice there. It's a great place to search for meteorites because there's a concentration mechanism that's unlike any on Earth. And that's, uh, if you look at Antarctica and the topography of it, it's basically an overturned bowl with the highest uh, points kind of right at the South Pole. So the ice sheet and the glaciers are basically flowing out to the edges of the continent uh, over the last, say, 30 million years. Over those 30 million years, meteorites have been raining down on the ice surface, being covered, incorporated into those ice sheets and those flowing glaciers. Uh, those, those flowing glaciers flow out to the coast, they hit mountains there uh, where they're stalled, the surfaces are bladed away, the meteorites that they carry are basically come up to the surface like a lag deposit. Um, 
so we go to these blue ice areas where these deep blue ice is exposed in Antarctica and we hunt for meteorites. Uh, there's someone uh, collecting a meteorite on the vast expanse of blue ice in Antarctica. Our search techniques are really visual. Um, it turns out the human eye is really good at sparting, spark, uh, spotting dark rocks on a light background, isn't that the thing? And then it's also very good if you have to search through a moraine and find meteorites. And that's where you're looking through literally millions of terrestrial rocks and trying to find the odd meteorite. Yeah, that was pretty quick. Um, anyway, so we go to Antarctica for uh, a couple months every year. We spend six, six weeks out uh, camping in the field and basically hunting and uh, recovering meteorites. Meteorites are mostly from asteroids there on the left. There's a couple pictures of uh, uh, the basic meteorites from asteroids, chondrites, and then there's an iron meteorite on the bottom there. They're basically uh, scientifically valuable because they record processes from the beginning of the solar system. So these, these are the first solid grains that are 4.5 billion years old. Uh, we also have, uh, we get meteorites once in a while if we're lucky from the moon. Those two pictures uh, of meteorites there are two out of the five pieces of a lunar breccia we found this, just this last season. So that's pretty exciting, they're pretty rare. And uh, then we have meteorites from Mars also. Um, so these, these samples are not owned by myself or, or e even our institutions. They're collected for the US program. The initial curation of these samples is done by uh, the Smithsonian and Johnson Space Center. And then they're actually released and made available for anybody in the world to study. A uh, good segue from that, Frank Corsetti actually showed a meteorite at my wedding uh, to talk about the age of the Earth and then showed part of the TJ Boundary to talk about the mass extinction between the Triassic and Jurassic that changed life forever and how he said, you know, in a marriage you can have disasters and you recover. Um, and are extinct, which makes me sad paleontologists, they probably swam backwards by squeezing water out. And this means their shell, which has an interesting shape, is also a big pain in the butt, because they got to swim and it's there, and how does it affect how they can swim? I'm interested in ecology, so I want to figure out how animals can function and how that relates to their interactions. Here, Nick Hebdick has been doing phenomenal physics work to try to figure out how water would flow around the different shells of ammonites. And then we can take this evolutionary tree that somebody proposed. Oh, well, you've got these different taxa. You do say, oh, after a mass extinction, ammonites go bananas, and they diversify and go around the world. But if we look at their shell shapes, and we cleverly mimic those shell shapes or make replicas of them in the physics experiments, then we can make interpretations like, well, who could swim? These guys could swim, OK. These guys, probably not. And then that brings you the paleoecological question of, well, if you weren't good at swimming, what the hell are you doing? And why are there so many of you? And why are you everywhere? And you know, maybe swimming is not the most important thing. Maybe there are a lot of other things that are important. So as a paleoecologist, we try to think on these different, um, uh, these different scales from how animals function in a sort of immediate process sense, and then how that can rate, relate to ecology and evolution over time. Um, sponges, what's the deal with those? Uh, animals make rocks. Lots of animals make lots of rocks. This is a suburban for scale. Shauna Hood took this picture. That entire mountain is made out of sponges. They look like stacked pint glasses. And one of the things we do is go find out that these sponges are there, discover them, hit them with a hammer, make microscope slides, and then try to figure out how did that sponge make a rock in a little patch, in a big bed, in a big area, and does anybody care that the sponges are there? Do other animals care, right? So this is some work that I'm doing, and Peter Maxliner, who's doing a master's with Turi and I, is working on uh, some chemostratigraphy and also this, where we say, okay, based on all the stuff we see in a microscope slide, can we kind of reconfigure how we go from the rock we hold in our hand, which looks hideous, to something that was alive at one time, that was built by animals. But as an ecologist, again, where this is of great interest to me is not to say, oh, there were some sponges once, but how is there an interplay between, say, a bank of brachiopods and sponges gradually taking over? Is it something that's gradual or that happens all at once? Is hysteresis involved? Can it go backwards at the same rate? 
And when we step back, did you know that there was a Permian sponge bonanza? <laughs> it was ridiculous in less than 10 to 30 million years where sponges were all up on Pangea, and we don't know why. And more importantly, we don't know if anyone cared. <laughs> Focusing his research on the Cedar Mountain Formation, which is early Cretaceous and found all kinds of dinosaurs all along this tiny strip in central Utah. And some of the faunas that he has found are quite amazing, include animals like Utah Raptor. Can we slide this behind? I wouldn't be surprised if he has <laughs> Uh, Tom Carius and others. Uh, the work that he's actually been doing is actually really important. Um, 20 years ago, we didn't think there were any dinosaurs from the early Cretaceous in North America. And the work that he's done and others really has led to our understanding of what's going on in that time period. Uh, some of the interesting things that happen is we go from a world, you think of the Jurassic as Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry. You know, it's a world dominated by Allosaurus, Stegosaurus, some long-necked sauropods. All of those animals really change in the next uh, 30 to 50 million years. Uh, Tyrannosaurs are big players in the world of the Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry at 150 million years ago. And that Jurassic fauna is dominated by Allosaurus, by far the top predator. This continues through this section of rocks, but at the very end, the last Allosaurus relative goes extinct. And that is the moment in time when Tyrannosaurus can step in and change the world forever. Allosaurus and their relatives kept Tyrannosaurus as bit players in the ecosystem until they disappeared in North America. And then once that happened, it was all downhill from there. Um, <laughs> Some of the other groups of dinosaurs that Jim works on are the armored dinosaurs, and just in this section of rocks, there's a huge amount of armored dinosaurs that we didn't know about before that have come to light in the last 20 years. Uh, in addition to that, Jim is also a stratigrapher, and he is redefining not only the Cedar Mountain Formation throughout Utah and other surrounding areas, um, he's a world expert on the Morrison Formation and has been busy uh, changing some of the members and lateral facies changes within the Morrison Formation as well. And with that, uh, Jim has probably 15 different projects that he would love to have somebody come and do a master's project on. So I encourage you to contact him if that's something you're interested in. Oh. <laughs> All right, I'm Lil Miyagi. <laughs> <laughs> that is not me. <laughs> okay, um, interesting. My background changed. That's okay. So uh, it hides the fact that it says Utah at the top. Uh, so my group is a rock and mineral physics group, and we study uh, mechanical and physical properties of rocks and minerals. Um, we are primarily interested in elastic and plastic properties, and in particular, how does rock deformation change the seismic signatures, and can we figure out what the seismic signatures of deformation are? And our primary interest is looking in the interior, mostly the lower mantle and the inner core. Um, and so sort of the first thing we do is we, we do experiments, so we have to generate high pressures, high temperatures, and it's also tricky because a lot of these phases are not stable to ambient conditions, so we have to study them under high condition. So the main workhorse is this thing called the diamond cell. Uh, we count a small sample between the tips of two gem quality diamonds. We can squeeze them to very high pressures. If we want to make things hot, they're optically transparent, so you can shine an infrared laser through. You can, make, you can cook things. Um, you can also do a different kind of heating. So you put a graphite heater around the diamond. This is all in a vacuum box. It turns out diamonds burn if you make them hot enough in air, um, and they may seem to. 
<laughs> so you can go to high pressure, you can deform these things, we can analyze them with x-rays in situ from a particle accelerator. We can also use something called a large volume press. Uh, that does larger samples, so for us that's a millimeter or two. Um, this goes to much lower pressure than this guy, and it takes uh, 24 megatons, or mega newtons of power to do that, whereas that it can turn into screws. Um, so we do these deformation experiments, and then we couple that with numerical simulations. So these are some finite element simulations one of my students is doing. And we use that to try and understand the microscopic um, deformation mechanisms that are occurring and to really mentor experiments. And if we think we know what's going on on, on that scale, then we try and scale up using simulations. So we'll take uh, a rock, we call them polycrystal plasticity simulations, so rock squishing <coughs> in simpler terms. We'll take those and we'll couple it to like a geodynamic model, where here we have a slab going down to the core of the boundary. We'll predict what kind of rock microstructures exist and what the seismic signatures of those are. And then we can compare that to, uh, I didn't have room to put a seismic tomography image, but we'll compare it to something like that. And if we can match it, then we start to think that we can maybe understand how things are flowing in the mantle and to try and image current day mantle convection cycles. Um, and the idea is that mantle convection is this engine that drives things like sun suction, upwellings, and plate tectonics. And so if we can image that, we can gain a better understanding as to why we have things like supercontinent cycles. Um, why we have seduction, um, why we have earthquakes, why we have multiple volcanoes. So, I know you have a little extra time for a question. <laughs> nope! <laughs> <laughs> Research focuses on some of the most iconic groups of dinosaurs, including the Tyrannosaurs and the Ceratopsians and the armored Ankylosaurs. And generally, what I do is I use morphometrics, little bumps, and changes on the bones, to enter into sophisticated software programs that will pump out a family tree. So, really, what I do as far as my research is I'm a dinosaur genealogist try to find the relationships between different individuals within groups of dinosaurs and between groups of dinosaurs. Um, at the same time, that's not what I get paid for. What I get paid for is to be a science evangelist. So generally I've been, f I've been averaging about 500 students a year in under undergrad courses, lower division, and using the scam of both dinosaurs <laughs> Hollywood movies to try to reach some people who are never going to get another look at science in their careers. And generally, um, we're trying to get a point, across the point of interconnectedness of life on Earth, how geologic processes work, and what animals and processes in the past have to tell us about our world today. Um, so if, if you're ever interested, you can take one of those classes. Um, most of my research, rather than a digger, I have graduated now to spending most of my time in dusty um, collection spaces across the world. Um, this is the back of the head of a giant dinosaur, which we never expected to be found in China. It's the only member of the Ceratopsian horned dinosaurs um, that lives outside of North America. And so generally it's trips like this and weeks and weeks um, looking at the different features and, and coding them into the software program. So that's what I do. Um, most of my students are undergrad students. I have two students who will be presenting um, in Australia. They're finding some of their research. So undergrads who are interested in, in research projects, I have more than we have students. So that's who I am. There actually is an email in white, but <laughs> I'd entertain a question if anybody has one. Fair enough. <laughs> or does your home the door? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Sometimes those conditions are changes in climate, changes in fluid chemistry, changes in the hydrology of the system, changes in the composition of the, of the environment, changes in the structural setting, um, and trying to see how that all gets recorded and preserved and what are the processes that are going on between fluids and sediments in those environments. I just to put my contact. <laughs> um, so uh, this has been applied to a lot of different types of projects using a lot of different types of tools. In my lab, we have some toys such as a really great petrographic microscope, so looking at, at microstructures and mineralogy and textures of things like grain coatings and orthogenic cements and minerals, so minerals that are forming in situ in pore spaces or in aqueous environments such as the salt flats. Um, and I've worked quite a bit in extreme environments, so places that are either really salty or really acidic or really arid, um, and, and interesting minerals form in those places that give you some unique indicators of how the environments have changed through time. Um, so we've got the petrographic microscope. We also look a lot at chemistry, um, a lot of different types of geochemistry. <coughs> we have an X-ray fluorescence instrument that I share with geography with Andrew Brunel. That's a core scanner, so if you have any cores and you want to get millimeter scale, elemental data, that's a, a tool that you can use for that. Um, we've also been playing with that to analyze brines, and it turns out it's okay for analyzing some brines, more from Evan on that later. Currently I have three PhD students working in my group, Evan Kipnis, Tori Lerbach, and Jeremiah Brunel, who are all working on different aspects of, of questions around how fluids and sediments interact, how landscapes evolve in response to different changes. More recently, this research has involved changes related to humans and how humans are changing. Um, sedimentological and hydrological processes in various landscapes such as the salt flats um, where I've got a lot of active research going on. Um, I also use a lot of remote sensing if we want to zoom out and look at a macro scale system, so reflectance spectroscopy, airborne or spaceborne spectroscopy to kind of map out how mineralogy changes through those systems. Um, and my work tends to be very collaborative and interdisciplinary. I'm always excited to learn new tricks and new tools. And so I've collaborated with many of you in this room and I'm excited to always throw something new at a question rather than be like, I'm gonna use this tool to answer a lot of questions. I've got my questions and I'm gonna use whatever tool we can get our hands on to try to answer that. So that allows me to learn a lot from my students. They always bring new tools and questions to, to the lab. Um, and I'm always learning new things, and I don't even get to tell you about the GCSC, but <laughs> I am also like Pete giving a DLS on November 14th. Ooh. I was told I would be doing that, and so you can learn more then. Thank you. Okay. Whoa. <laughs> when they told me I had three minutes for this, I thought to myself, three minutes? That's just about right for a song. <laughs> I hope you like it. Please hold your questions to the end. <laughs>
improved paleo climate method for proxy interpretation. <laughs> now, what I really like to talk to you about today is some new projects. We're just starting. We've got new projects. Projects. We've got two new projects. <laughs> <laughs> now, the spatial group, it's a mighty good group. Spatial group, it's a group you want. Spatial group, it's a mighty good group. And if you like, you gotta follow us on Twitter because we're really kind of awesome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's evaporation, transpiration, traffic change cause consternation. But if I soak some neon data, we'll figure out what controls the ratio of the spatial group. Spatial <laughs> group, 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 spatial group, 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 that counted for our soldiers at the point of pride. The ice coats are within their bones to help the military bring them home. <laughs> We're a mighty good crew, spatial crew. It's a group you watch. We're a spatial crew. It's a mighty good crew. And if you like, you should follow us on Twitter because our science is awesome. And if you like. <laughs> Somebody had to do it. <laughs> All right, I'm a broadly trained earth scientist. Actually, I'm not a trained earth scientist. I'm a biochemist and a toxicologist who started as an MD, PhD. People don't know that about me. Now, mostly what I do, I try to think, what, what is what I'm working on? What's the end of the world? What happens to snow? Snow is really just the water. Snow is the water that's really complicated and gets into the ground, uh, fills reservoirs, and recharges groundwater, and lets trees grow. And, moves mine waste, does all these sort of things because snow comes in when there's not a lot of energy around. Uh, when there's a lot of energy around, you get songs like from the spatial group, the BT that Gabe was talking about. When there's not a lot of energy around, that water gets in deep and that's the water that we rely on. And so I'm an accidental hydrologist, probably 80% of the work that we do. We've got a couple NSF projects and a couple projects funded by stakeholders that are looking at what happens to snow, how much of it sublimates, how does it change the climate around it. How does it recharge groundwater? How does it deal with all sorts of the cool, funky things that it does? And I kind of like skiing, so it fit that I came to Utah. Um, all sorts of crazy research on there. If you go by my lab, the students have called it the eco cryo hydro bio geochemistry Met lab. <laughs> so again, broadly trained, broadly curious earth science. It's the highest compliment I can think of. That's why I like it here, broadly curious. Um, in other parts of my job, I had a partial appointment as a faculty member, a partial as doing other stuff. Uh, I worked as state EPSCOR director, and one of the things I noticed, there were 200 faculty, 50% of the faculty said they had expertise in water here, but there was no water program. So I spent a few years working with a bunch of colleagues and house through the GCSC, this interdisciplinary certificate in hydrology and water resources. It's open to all students all across campus as long as you can do the basic math and physics. Uh, we have six colleges that are participating in it right now. We had our first two graduates, it's two years old. It's an awesome program, it's a wonderful opportunity. The other thing that I noticed is like, we have a lot of rock stars. The title for today's seminar was the rock star introduction, um, that are doing research around here, but it's really hard to find it. So again, working with GCSC and colleagues across campus, we've been trying to codify that research, bring it all together, so that we can find it, students can find it, um, and more importantly, funding agencies can find it so they can see what we can bring to the table in terms of large coordinated research projects. How we move beyond an individual research project and string our strengths together, um, including our musical talents, <laughs> to address uh, real issues that are facing the Western US or really semi-arid regions around the world. It's similar, we do work in China, and that's all, folks. The grumpy old man closes off the grumpy old man. <laughs> okay. This is our lineup for next week. Um, 
Hopefully there'll be some more folks. You see, we, we still have a little bit of time left. It goes quickly. Hopefully it's enjoyable. I learned an awful lot today. Hopefully you guys did too. Uh, we'll do something similar. Um, we need to come up with a different transition, but we'll come up with something. Lowell's in charge. Of Airport. Airport. <laughs> I was the <laughs> That'll really speed things up. So maybe we could have everybody sing there. Hey, just spitballing ideas in a broad interdisciplinary sense. Okay, thanks for indulging this sort of uh, uh, slightly different story. Thanks.